fairly familiar verses of scripture, but uh, we'll um, we'll look uh, at what the Lord uh, hopefully give us a, 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 a new light of this. Luke 15, I mean, excuse, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. The Bible says, and he, meaning Christ, and he said a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a great, a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him unto his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, but no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to, and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father, but when he was set, but when he was yet a great far off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for the church, uh, for strengthening in us in a time that is very, very difficult, Lord. We pray those that uh, have this virus, Lord, that you would heal their bodies. Lord, we pray for the families and the health care workers that are caring for them, Lord, that you might uh, keep them safe and protect them. Give us understanding and knowledge as we should go ahead uh, in the... Uh, things that you would have us to do. And we pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, I'm going to be preaching this morning on wasting your substance. Now, uh, we'll read it in a minute. I believe the substance that he's talking about is what you're made out of, who you are and what you do, how that that can be wasted if we're not very, very careful. If you're a mother with children, you can throw that away if you're not very, very careful. If you're a man with a ministry, you can very quickly waste what you have and it'll soon be gone. A substance is who you are. And when you begin to think about that, uh, who are you? You know, uh, I'm a preacher and if I'm not very, very careful, I will waste that substance that thing that the Lord all God, God Almighty's given me, and I'll waste it. It'll be gone. And, and in the years to come, kick back and think, what have I done? Uh, I'm a nurse. I can waste that. If I, if I never went back to work again, the four years I spent in college would have been a waste. And so we find then that this man wasted a whole lot. And you think about who you are and how old you are and where you're at in this life and think about the substance that you have and maybe the substance that's already gone. We need to be very careful with what the Lord gives us. And again, we'll go back to verse 21. And he said a certain man had two sons. Now, if you, uh, I believe both these sons were legitimate sons. I, both, I believe they both were his own. And I believe they were entitled to a, an inheritance. And that's why the boy asked for his now. Now, you don't have a job in the glorious kingdom of God if you're not a son. If you're not a daughter of the Almighty. But if you do, you have an inheritance. You have something that can be used for the name of the Lord. And the question is, are you using it? Are you, are you doing anything in the kingdom of God to promote the kingdom of God? It's your substance. It's what you have. 
and we need to be about it. So we find, first of all, that this son was a legitimate son and entitled to his inheritance. And the younger of them. Now, that's your next problem is your age. Uh, you do some pretty stupid stuff when you're young. Uh, you know, the very best thing that will protect you from that, if you have godly parents, just listen to them. Uh, you know, at, at 18, you think you've got the world by the tail, and about 25, you begin to realize how stupid you really are. And, and, in, and in that interim, in that seven years between, you know what? You can waste some stuff that you'll never get back. That, that you will never be able to reclaim because you've destroyed your own testimony and, and have nothing left to use. And, and so we find that his age, I think, is significant, and it ought to be significant for us that we would be very careful when we're in those years and when our children are in those years to try to give them some extra guidance. You know what? I, I've seen good godly parents when they get grown. Oh, well, they're done. No. You need to be the type of parent that, he, and if they think you're prying, they just think you're prying to say, listen, you know, you need to think about what you're doing. And, 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 and you know, the Lord God never gives up on us. If he wasn't still giving me advice, I would be in a world of a mess. And so we find then that uh, he didn't have good decision making skills yet and the younger of them said to his father father give me the portion of goods that followeth me now if one of my boys or one of my daughters came to me and said this I would have to think initially at least they didn't think very much of me that all they's interested in is what little bit of stuff I had and what little bit of money that I might have that's really all that my relationship meant to them. And people like that, uh, you know, I just seem to avoid. Can you imagine how, how horrifying, how in, embarrassing, how, how difficult it would be if one of your children came up and said, I want my part. Now, uh, my impulse in the flesh would be no way. But I believe this wise father knew exactly what needed to happen and had the ability to look down the road and see what would be best, so he did exactly what the boy asked him. And he divided unto them his living, and not many days after, the young son gathered all together, and he took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance. Now, uh, I'm assuming that means the goods and the monies that befell him, but as we see in a minute, it also cost him his character. It, it even cost him who he was as a Jew, because, listen, Jews had nothing to do. They wouldn't even come near unto a pig, and he find himself taking care of pigs that belonged to a heathen man. He wasted who he was. And, and, and it was almost too late when he realized that. And many, many times we say, well, I'll wait on this. I'll serve the Lord more then. I'll preach the gospel then. I'll do this. When I get a little bit of better financial shape, I'll do it then. And then suddenly we realize we're 50, 60, 70 years old and we've wasted it all. And there's no time left. This man wasted his substance. Yeah. I want to go to, you can just kind of hold your place there. Uh, go to uh, Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 12. Read a, read a little bit about Abraham and what his substance was. Genesis chapter 12 and verse uh, 15. Genesis 12 and verse 15. Uh, go with me to First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 28. First Chronicles chapter 28. 
First Chronicles 28, and we'll begin reading in the first verse. And David assembled all the princes of Israel and all the princes of the tribes and the captains of the companies and ministered to the king by course and captains over the hundreds and the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king. Now the stewards were one, the ones that handled the financial portion. And of his sons with the officers and with the mighty men and with all the valiant men under Jerusalem. And David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear, my brethren and my people, as for me, I had, I had in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and made, re uh, and made ready for the building. Now, I want you to see, first of all, all these people that was under the... Uh, the under the ability under the leadership of the king now he could do with them whatever they asked and and uh he could uh he could command them to go remember that's how he had uriah the hittite killed is he told his leader he said you put him in the worst part of the battle and pull back so he'll die so he had a great authority and so what the question was is how he was going to use it see that was his substance also we see that he had a great deal of financial means the only one that was really richer than him was his son solomon and, and so that's the second part of our substance this morning and how are you going to use that for the uh, the things that God has given us to do. You have the ability of leadership. You have the ability of, uh, of your financial resources. And so what are you going to do? Verse number uh, 3, the Bible says, But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. So I want you to see that also... David's actions limited him in what he could do, uh, limited his testimony, limited him in what he could serve. And so I think what we ought to do is be very, very careful what we do with our lives because you can limit yourself. You can, you know what? I, I really think sometime if I go down to Cumberland City to preach the gospel, I would be a laughing stock. And why? Because I wasted a whole lot. I wasted my testimony in the land that I'm from. And, and, and so we find then what we have to do then when we're older is, uh, as those saying goes, you've got to reap what you sow. And so David had a great deal that he could use, but we'll find the only role that he could really play was to gather the material. To set aside the things that would go toward the building of the temple, but he could not be involved in. See, he limited, he limited what he could do, and he did it by his own actions. He did it what uh, he did it by his. Uh, he limited his substance in the way that he could serve the Lord. Uh, go with me to the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter number uh, 8. Ezra 8. And we'll begin reading in verse, we'll just read verse 21. Ezra 8 and verse 21, the Bible says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before God to seek Him uh, to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for our substance. 
So we, we, you, you know that the story of Ezra, they're rebuilding the temple, and the book of Nehemiah, then they come, the Lord God Almighty comes down and occupies the temple, and, and we find in the book of Ezra that they were really sincerely looking for what they ought to be doing. It had been so long since worship had occurred that they didn't know how to do it anymore. And you know what? I really think that's the day and age which we live that most people don't know how to worship. We're so afraid that we're going to look like somebody else. We're going to look like the Pentecostals. We're going to look like that. And we're going to look like this. And we, that we no longer worship. And, and we find here in the book of Ezra that it's the very same situation that they weren't certain about worship, and, but they were willing to give their substance. What, whatever was necessary, what was ever needful, they were willing to do it. And you know what? Uh, sometimes I think this is the problem. We value our substance more than we value the Lord. Yeah. We're not willing to pour it out and say, well, you give it to me anyway. It really belongs to you, so here it is. We get stingy. You know what? That's the nature of the flesh it is to get stingy and to become a hoarder. You know, it, it, even in uh, the days of the wandering of the children of Israel, it, it, if they ever took too much manna and tried to stow it back for the next day except on the Sabbath, it would rot on them. So why do you need it anyway? And so we find then our substance is everything we are, everything about us. Now I want you to go back to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Luke, this time in chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 in the first verse. Luke chapter 8 in the first verse and it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and shewing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities Mary called Magdalene out of whom went seven devils and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others which, were mini which ministered unto him of their substance. So with everything they had, they ministered unto Christ. Now, this is my own opinion. Ministering to Christ in the church age is impossible because he's not with us. To minister to somebody, if I got down here and washed Joey's feet and, and, and put lotion on them, uh, that's a ministry. Number one, he can't do it himself. And number two, just because I did it of my substance. Uh, and we sometimes, uh, it needs to become that simplistic. Ministry is not just preaching the gospel. Ministry is what using whatever element that you have and using it to the glory of God. Yeah. That's ministry. And, and, and so we find then that uh, these women use what they have. And in that day, listen, women couldn't do everything that they do today. The, the, women, the women's liberation movement had not occurred. They couldn't hold jobs. They couldn't do like everybody else. But they did what they could do. And that's where we ought to be. Doing whatever is possible with what we do have. Don't, don't pray about what you don't have. Uh, pray about what you do have. And the Lord will bless you for it. So look at these women just for a minute. Uh, Mary Magdalene. She was in a bad way, wasn't she? And uh, uh, possessed with seven devils. And you know, uh, I bet she was a pretty miserable woman, don't you? Um, if you don't believe in demonic possession, uh, you need to get your head out of the sand. It's still a very, very real thing that God's people have to deal with. 
And you know what? We need to deal with it in prayer. You, you remember what he said? I think it was to the church at Philadelphia. I believe that was right. One he had real no criticism of, which I think is significant. He said, I know where Satan's seat is. I know where he comes in and meets with you at. And so we find then that we are no different. That was the church age. This is the church age. That there really is no difference today. And so demonic possession is a real thing. And listen, I believe if you find an individual that has been relieved of such a thing, they'll be very glorifying to God. Now, uh, I understand it. Uh, one of me and Donna's friends from school, Lynn, was telling me about it. I hadn't seen this fella in years. Uh, named Sean Pritchett. He was in our class in high school. And Lynn was telling me about this thing. The Lord had saved him and brought him through drugs and, and brought him out on the other side and healed his body. And he wrote a book about it of the goodness of God. Now, if you know Sean Pritchett in our day, for him to even write a book is, amazing, it is miraculous to me. And then on top of that, tell the story of Christ. See, he used his substance, and, you know, he, he, he knew what it had been about. He'd been delivered. Amen. And you know what? He told Glenn this one thing, I'll serve him to the day I die. He planned the ministry. And, and so we find then that we ought to be the same way that we are willing to serve God because what he did for us. Now, I want you to see also, and I don't know which of these women it was, it said that he also had, had cured their infirmities. They had been sick. They had been, they had been in a situation where their health was bad, and, and the Lord Jesus healed them, and because he healed them, he can, they continued on in the ministry of Christ. So we find that these women, Joanna, uh, I always think of, uh, Joanna Pratt, when I read this scripture, it said that she uh, was in Herod's house. See, Herod, Herod was a heathen. And we have to assume that Joanna, being a servant of Herod, was a heathen too. And apparently the Lord saved her. And she left Herod's house. And you know what? That's a good position to be in. Plenty of food down at Herod's house, isn't it? Plenty of things to do, plenty of money. And now we find her ministering to a man that don't even have a place to lay his head. See, that, 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 is, that is real ministry, is it not? That, that is doing whatever you can do for the cause of Christ. And that's the, the nature of these women. It says they used... They used their substance. So now with that thought, let's go back to our text. And hopefully you understand now what this rich young ruler wasted. It wasn't his, just his money. It wasn't just his testimony. It was everything he was. Everything he had been was gone. He wasted it. Now, uh, Let's begin in verse 14 of our text. And when he had spent all. Now listen, you may be having a good time this morning, but eventually the good times run out. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Now here we find the almighty God of heaven, that he, he sent an entire famine on the land for one individual. Have you ever thought about what God does in his mighty grace to help you and on the very flip side, all he does to put you to your knees? Everybody wringing their hands, corona, corona, corona. You know what? That's under the mighty hand of God and he probably sent it on this ungodly world to judge them justly, just as they should be. Yeah. See, it's all under his hands. We don't, we don't have to stress it. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to be concerned about it. It's all under his grace. Don't waste it. 
Young people, don't waste it. Don't, don't, don't get involved with righteous living. Verse 15. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. Desperate times call for desperate measures. But you know what the real problem is in 15? He hadn't repented. He wasn't sorry to his daddy. He, he wasn't ready to acknowledge his mistake. You know what? Repentance is almost a gone thing in Baptist churches today. You, you don't find anybody apologizing for sin. Uh, you know what? Every time we sin and we sin openly, we put this church at high risk. We're covenant together, are we not? God placed you here. He teaches us we're just like a body. Fingers and toes and legs. So if you're a leg and you get out involved in sin, we got one bum leg to deal with. Is that not true? And, and, and so we find then, as, as the Lord is, is teaching this, he still wasn't to the point that he could say, I was wrong and daddy was right. That is a repentance. I was the one that was mistaken and the Almighty was correct. That is what real repentance is about. And when he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, he sent him unto his fields to feed swine. Now, um, most Jews would have refused this. Uh, I believe at this point he had none of his character left. He, he had nothing valuable left in him. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, but no man gave unto him. Now in verse 16, you find a little slither of a, of a saved person, uh, of a man that really does know God because he was honest. Now if I was out there feeding corn shucks to some pigs, and I was hungry and wanted one, you know what every one of us would probably do? Just dive right in, would we not? Get the biggest, cleanest one we could find. But this man, being the father's son, he hadn't been told that he could eat it, so he kept giving them to the hogs. You know what? That's an unusual person. That's someone that, that, that has something about them above the average. So we, we, we see that this individual was a saved person because we can tell it by his actions. Verse 17. And when he came to himself. Now, coming to himself if he was lost would have done him no good. Because you know what? Uh, the Bible says that Judas repented himself. It wasn't God that repented. But this man came to himself and the end result was repentance. Going back to the Father. Going back to the one that loved him. Going back to the one that, that, that had directed him and guided him as a child. And when he came to himself, how many hired servants of my father had bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I and am no worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. You know what? Uh, one thing we ought to be able never to get over is the, the compassion that the Almighty has showed us. Listen, you were no pearl of a great price. You were just like me, lost and black in your sin and in need of a Savior. And you see that the Father came to him. He was excited that he was back. He, he was rejoicing that, that his son had gotten out of that situation, the situation that had took him straight to the bottom. And, and he rejoiced in that, and he went straight to 
uh, the young man on his way back, on his way back home. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great far off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned against I have, and, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Now, I want you to see, finally, this rich man, this young, uh, this young person, finally got his priorities in check. Now, if you will see his plan, back in verse 15, I'll go to my father, or 17, I'll go to my father and say, Father, forgive me. But when he got there, what did he say? He said, I have sinned before the Lord and you. See, he, he finally acknowledged it was a spiritual problem. It just wasn't wasting his father's money. It was a true spiritual problem. And he finally knew it. You know, you know what causes us so much grief in this life? It's spiritual problems. It's taking our focus off the Almighty and placing it here on this earth and uh, not following what the Lord would have us to do. Um, we need to be people like this young man. And if you know the rest of the story, the father says, bring the fatted calf and kill him, for my son which is lost is now home. He said he also brought the best coat and the ring and placed it on his finger. And that, that ring is just like this one says, me and Donna are one. Back then there were family rings. And it would depend on which son you were, what your ring looked like and how it identified you. And he put that back on. Now, with that great rejoicing, we know his brother got jealous. That's a sad commentary, isn't it? You know what? When someone repents and you see that closeness, rejoice with them. Uh, don't, don't get in your mind and your heart, well, I bet it won't last. Rejoice with them. Be happy for them. Uh, thank God, because see, you know, next time around, it could be you. <coughs> The next time around, it could be you. So we, as the Lord's people, if we want to use our substance, we need to get to it. You know what? I don't know how this corona thing will end. Uh, I, I've studied a little bit about it. Don't know much about it as I should, I guess. But I know until something happens, I'm going to use my substance. I'm going to use every resource I have for the furtherance of the gospel. And that's what we need to do, too. You know what? I said this before, and I, I still believe that me and Donna was talking along these lines the other day on about day three or four of the seven hamburgers. And she says, this is the last day. And, you know, lift up your hand and give God the praise. But we have more than most. You know what? If this thing don't lighten up, about... 10, 12 weeks down the road, them hard hamburgers probably sound good to me, won't they? I don't know what that will be. But until then, I'm going to use my substance. Who I am and what I am and any kind of influence I have for the kingdom. That, that, that's all we need to focus on. That's all we need to do is to continue focusing on who the Almighty is.